everybody, and thanks for the opportunity for us to get together and have a quick chat about SAP. There's There has been an awful lot happening in this space. It is a very vibrant market. There's a lot of big opportunity here. And so I'm, I'm really excited about the opportunity to get together with you today and talk a little bit about how Cisco is, is playing in this space. We have a lot of stuff that we're going to cover today. So we're not going to go into depth on every single slide. We're going to talk about the main points. And we're going to, like was mentioned, we're going to have the slides available for you that you can go back in, dig a little bit deeper. And then if you have questions following on, we'd be happy to answer those questions. But as a quick roadmap today, we're going to talk a little bit about why you should be as excited as we are about going into the SAP space. Um, and if you're already there, I think you've, you've captured that enthusiasm. There's still some really interesting things going on there. We're going to talk about Cisco's solution. We're going to talk about changes that are happening and how customers can implement their SAP and their SAP HANA solution. We're going to talk a little bit about business continuity, but the real important stuff is right at the end where George is going to come in, and we're going to talk about where you can get more information. We're going to cover a lot of ground today, so it's going to be really important when George is talking just to really understand that there is just a lot of information that's available to you that we would love to be ready and share that with you. So let's get started. SAP is one of the top three software companies in the world in terms of uh, the revenue that they're driving in the enterprise space. Some would say that they're actually the number one enterprise customer. In fact, a third of all enterprise customers have SAP in some form or another, including Cisco. They're the number one in terms of enterprise revenue that flows through their software. And the SAP platform um, sets the standard within your customer in terms of future buying activities. Typically what happens is whoever gets that core part of that data center where the customer standardizes on that core of the data center, they'll stay with that standardization for a lot of the other data center decisions that get made. Because what's happening is, is that's a strategic investment on your customer's part, and they're putting that in in the direction that they want to do it way they want to go, so they're looking for a partner that they can work with to do this as they go down that strategic road. Um, so having the ability to, to offer a very competitive solution in this space really gives us a good insight to have that. Also, it's lucrative. There's a lot of activity happening in this space. Um, right now, IDC says there's somewhere between 7 to $8 billion um, opportunity in the SAP space and infrastructure alone. Uh, and um, that is growing at, at a very high pace. Cisco took down somewhere between five and six hundred million last year alone. So there is a lot of opportunity for everybody on this call to meet quotas and to get the revenue that they need. I wanted to chat a little bit um, about why you want to work with Cisco. So. Um, the SAP market is there, the SAP market is big, SAP is driving a huge change through their market because of the introduction of SAP HANA, we're going to talk about that in a second, but why should you work with Cisco? Well, because the dynamics of the enterprise market is changing, those enterprise applications, this common buying centers is changing. Now, What's not changing is workload. We're still doing transactional workloads or analytic workloads. But what customers are looking for in their deployments is changing. It used to be things like, what's the SD benchmark? What's the speed of your networking? How much storage do you have? How do you set this thing up to be able to stay up and running, but I'm willing to make investment to minimize the amount of time that that weight symbol spins, but not too much. It's changing. Now we're having to talk to, am I meeting the business need? Do I have a strategic direction? Is it responsive? Is my infrastructure as responsive to change as my business is? Or is my data center slowing me down? I have a, had a uh, chance to talk to a customer who told me that in their space it takes them 300 days to make a business change because their IT department can't react fast enough. The characteristics of what it looks like is changing, and so is the deployment model. It used to be on-premise. Now you have customers that are still on premise at my place, or maybe they're at your place, they're in the, you know, at a hosted center, or maybe they're in the cloud. But a lot of customers are driving towards this hybrid cloud story. It's, it's going to be everywhere. I'm going to have some of this on my 
my territory and I'm going to have some of it up in the cloud and I'm going to have regional distri distribution. It's changing the way that customers are looking at how they want a deployment. The two major changes I want to highlight is the line of business and the IT requirements are no longer distinct. You have to sell to both of those. When you're talking to the customer, you have to talk not only to the IT, but you got to step into those corner offices and get a little bit of an idea of where's that company going because, like I started off with, this is a strategic direction that they're going. Similarly, Cisco is uniquely qualified and uniquely situated to meet the needs of that next generation data center we talked about where the data is going to be my place, your place, or in every place. Cisco has introduced this idea of an intent-based data center. The data center used to be I have servers, I have networking, I have storage, I tie it together in a way that my networking and my storage and my compute people will let me do. I load the software, I manage it, and I don't touch it for as long as possible. I don't want it to break. That's changing. What's happening now is customers are looking at their plans and their strategy and they're saying, I want my data center to be as flexible as my business is. I need to be able to have a data center that understands and, and is able to respond to how that's happening. We've built that already based on the UCS, the Nexus, and the hyperconverged. And many of you are already aware of UCS and the whole idea of policy and policy automation. But we're also bringing this idea of Cloud Center and ACI and the app dynamics to address the software needs as well as this tetration to address the security and the machine learning aspects. If you look at where the data center is going with Cisco, we're all about bringing programmability and software to understand what the customer is looking to do. This is exactly what the customers are looking for today. They're enterprise customers. They're looking at how do I have a data center that allows me to keep my data here or move my data there if I need to. This allows us to bring in this universal policy framework. Cisco is all about policy, the idea of a defined, definitive, solution or, 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 or uh, infrastructure architecture that allows you to, with very high degree of confidence, push down the requirements into the infrastructure that your business needs. So we talk about hardware-based intelligence, you know, we're talking about the UCS policies, the ACI policies, we're talking about um, the 8-bit controllers to be able to, and the UCS manager, to have the ability to define that policy, but also software-based intelligence. How do you understand your global dependency mapping? Or how do you, how do you create a blueprint for your security? ACI, nothing's, nothing works until you tell it to. Everybody else's network, everything works until you tell it not to. You know, so this whole idea of having this next generation data center with Cisco is the way that we're looking at. So have we met that? Yeah. When we had a recent IDC study, 20% of the market wanted to talk to Cisco first. Cisco was number one. That number looks low, but that was the, the number one customer, number one vendor that customers wanted to talk to to understand what's going on down the road for their SAP and SAP data centers. Cisco is well positioned. We've talked about this policy base, the ability to put automation and orchestration on top of it. Cisco dominates the SAP cloud market. If you look at the service providers, Cisco is in, I think it's 70 to 80% of the service providers that are offering SAP services to the customer base. It is a huge advantage, including CenturyLink I've highlighted here. CenturyLink is one of those service provider partners that is exclusively working with Cisco, and the value that they're bringing to the customer is the ability to stand up a landscape in their cloud environment in about 70 minutes. That's a full three-tier BW infrastructure. Because to our customers, innovation matters. And we talk a lot about innovation. We talk about the converged infrastructure, the 40, 40 gig programmable network, the whole policy base. We can talk about all of these things, but the question is, is it true and where does it pay off? Mission critical applications with confidence, security. We've reduced the complexity by putting everything into that automation. We've unified all that networking, ultimately getting us down to shorter time to value faster deployment, this whole idea of being able to meet the customers where they are. 
I've talked a lot about what we do. This is what SAP has to say about what we've done in this space. 2017, Cisco was awarded the innovation leader for SAP because of the work that we've done in this space. They've been talking about simplifying. That is what Cisco has done for their customers. We roll it out, we set it up, we turn it on, and it works. All right, so I've made the case for why Cisco. Do we do single servers? Absolutely. Do we do converged infrastructure? Absolutely, we're the leader in converged infrastructure. Do we do product automation, cloud-based? You bet. And the advantage is it's all built on that same layered capability. I wanted to take just a few seconds and talk about HANA itself and why, why this is important. HANA, SAP created HANA to change the game. If you're a jaded individual, they're changing it by saying you can't use Oracle, you can't use Microsoft, you can't use DB2. By 2025, you gotta be running HANA. They're forcing everybody through a database change and by forcing everybody through the database change, they're forcing every customer to go through a strategic decision a strategic remapping of how their data centers are gonna work for their new business model. This is a huge opportunity to go in and get into those accounts that had previously been locked out because of, of, uh, of, of other vendors owning that account. This new data center, this new database, this new platform combines a lot of the aspects of what had previously been distributed across the infrastructure, the landscape, and they've brought it into that platform. It has the data, the data tables. The data tables are residing in memory for high, very fast uh, um, extraction for transaction processing and decision support. But they've also put into that platform a lot of the features and functions that the applications had done in the past. In the past, you had to extract data out of the database, bring it to the application, do your function, and then report the result. Now that function is run in the database where the data resides, and the results are pushed out. So you get a lot more flexibility in that. But the key point is, it's driving the customer to make a decision to make a change. Cisco started in the middle. We started with the vBlock. We started the journey with HANA, with vBlock, and with FlexPod. Everybody else started with a new appliance design. Cisco started with a converged infrastructure. We knew this was the direction that SAP was going. That's why today we have almost 49% market share alone in converged infrastructure for SAP. TDI was where we started. We did a specific configuration for the appliance. But the advantage of that converged infrastructure is all you have to do is layer the automation and orchestration on top of it, and you have this idea of a policy-driven TDI, application aware. It knows, the infrastructure knows the application. It's tuned to the application, it's flexible, it's dynamic, it's secure, it's highly available. It meets the needs of a lot of those SAP customers. This was the first place that Cisco differentiated. It was right on our starting point, out the door, TDI. The servers that we're using for our solutions, uh, we have rack mount servers and we have blade servers. These are our rack mount servers. We have an eight socket, a four socket and a couple of two sockets. The eight socket server can handle 12 terabytes of transactional database in memory in that server, it's huge. The four socket can do six terabytes of transactional data and the two sockets can do three terabytes. The big difference from last year, the four sockets and the two sockets have enough internal storage to be able to run everything with hard drives. So that low cost entry point with spinning media the advantage, further advantage of that four socket box is you can use spinning media and SSDs and you can have a targeted non-production disaster recovery system in that one system because it has enough drive space for both of them. As before, we do have blade servers. These are a favorite of the converged infrastructure. We have the four socket on top, the two socket on the bottom. They handle the same workloads as the rack mount servers. Of course, they don't have as much internal storage as those rack mount servers do, but they do have the same performance. And so in, in any case, depending on which way you want to go or the customer wants to go, you can do rack mount, you can do blade, you can mix them because the policies are virtually the same. And your ability to deploy is the same across the table. When it comes to scale-out appliances, um, we've done one appliance for scale-out. 
90 plus percent of the market, especially in the scale out, has moved to what's called tailored data center integration. Think of it as customized solution. But we do have an appliance. What's interesting and new about this appliance is it's the only appliance on the market with software defined storage as part of the appliance design. We're using an all Cisco design 40 gig networking switch. We're using blades. In this picture is blades, but you could just as easily do it with a rack mount server. And we use the C240 for data. That's our storage. C240s with a partner software, MapR. You've heard of them before. They're a Hadoop big data player. But they have a proprietary file system, which we partnered with them on to do this software defined storage. Um, while that's an interesting play, I would have to highlight that, um, I'll just skip over that. Uh, this is the scaling, it scales. Um, one of the advantages of software-defined storage is as you, you, you grow your storage, as you grow your compute, as you add more memory into your database, you just add more storage. So they grow together, both in performance and scalability and bandwidth, they all grow together. Uh, as opposed to a standard enterprise storage, which is based on a, a header that gets put in and then storage sits behind it. As I mentioned before, a vast majority of those scale-out solutions are driven by a more standard converged infrastructure. Uh, we have here FlexPod versus Stack. We have the Cisco MapR solution. It can be done as a TDI or, or as an appliance. We have our flash stack with peer storage, and we continue the very lucrative business with vBlock around VCE. The whole idea of having a converged infrastructure that's policy enabled and policy driven to deploy on. This has been one of the leading aspects of Cisco's um, play in the SAP space. I've added this for your reference for later. Uh, you can see here how these different servers will scale, whether they're scale up or scale out. In both decision support OLAP or transactional OLTP. You will see in the top right corner there's a bull server. Just wanted to identify that to let you know that if you do have customers that need more than what you can get out of an eight socket, we do have a partnership with Bull to address all the way up to 16 sockets. More to come next year. So that is available should you want it. Similarly, I want to talk very briefly about solution support. This is really important. And this is really differentiated for Cisco and really differentiated for our customers. This allows the customer to come to a single point and get support for their appliance or for their TDI implementation. Everybody else is going to tell them you have to go to the storage vendor for support, your compute vendor for support, your operating system vendor for support, and your networking vendor for support. Cisco sells a solution support that encapsulates all of those under one front end to manage it. We own it. We manage it. We'll drive it. If we need to, we'll reach to those partners to help support. But we own it. We drive it. And that's a very big deal, and that is a huge differentiator because of the partnerships that we have with those storage partners that allow us to do that. Um, it is something that I really encourage you to highlight with your customer when you're talking with them. And in fact, you can raise the point, whether it's appliance or TDI, it's the same level of support. Um, just a Quick reference on some of the Cisco validated designs. Uh, Cisco goes ahead. We build these things out as a reference architecture. We test them. We document it step-by-step -step cookbook. Here I've given you an example of six, five of them, of just a random, not quite random, but FlexPod, FlexPod with ACI, FlashStack. But we have uh, more that are available to you at the end. Uh, but these are here really to help you sell, but also to help you do the installation. All right. I've been talking about TDI. I want to touch on TDI a little bit and just make sure we're all on the same page before we move on. When SAP started this, they started it off as an appliance. And the idea was you shared nothing. The networking was dedicated. The storage was dedicated. The compute was dedicated. The operating system was dedicated. In that infrastructure, you only ran HANA. And you had to meet a very high level of performance guarantee a delivery model and a support model to ensure as high of possibility of customer support. The problem with the appliance model is that it forced you to put a fence around your system and treat it unique, different than everything else in your data center. And a lot of, for a lot of customers, that just doesn't work because they've made investments in storage. 
They've made investments in networking. They have people trained on how to do it. And so SAP over time has started loosening those restrictions on the appliance. They started with storage. They said, you know what, you can take that dedicated storage out, you can connect your HANA to a shared enterprise storage, as long as it met the requirements for HANA, it's been certified, you can go ahead and do that. And then they went a little bit more. You can share the networking. Use your backbone. Use your data center backbone if you want to. Have a dedicated network if you want to, or have a multi-tenant network. This is where Cisco worked with SAP. We worked with them on that definition and on the deployment. We showed them how to do it. We had the first customers in this space. As you would expect, Cisco, we helped with the shared networking. Then for the third phase, they said E5 support. Now in Haswell, Broadwell, the processors from Intel were E5, E7. All of the appliances were on the E7, that high, high end. Expensive processors. They're great processors. They could do a lot of work, but they were really expensive. So they introduced this idea of an E5, the low-end, smaller processor for smaller workloads where you don't need this, this huge compute capability. This sort of goes away with Skylake, which is where we are today. Skylake, Intel has eliminated the delineation between E5 and E7. It's now just one continuous band of processors. Um, SAP HANA on power. Not a lot of benefit there for Cisco's customers. We don't sell power. We are seeing IBM power uh, in a TDI-only model. Um, it's sort of a it's sort of a unique unicorn out there that we're, um, customers are being plied with. Um, we encourage them to continue looking at x86, of course. And then the fifth phase. This is called Phase Five TDI. This is brand new. It has just been introduced by SAP, and this is where they've pretty much taken all of the rest of the fetters off of that appliance model. And it allows you to share your stores, share your networking, but now you have more control over the definition of that compute. And so in this phase five, they're allowing you to have much more flexibility in processor selections and sizings, and how your memory gets configured in, et cetera. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Now I've got a bunch of slides here, we're not going to go through them. These are from SAP. I have included them in the deck so that you can refer to them later. But I wanted to highlight a quick difference between TDI and the appliance model. In the appliance model, there's very little flexibility, but Cisco is responsible for the performance of that system. We designed it, we've tested it, we delivered it, we support it. If it's functioning within the bounds of HANA as was intended by SAP, then that system should be up and running. It's fully provided in that, in that space. TDI, that responsibility moves from the vendor like Cisco to the customer, not to the SI, not to the SP, not to the hardware vendor, but to the customer. The customer now makes those architecture decisions of where they want to spend their money to meet their business need, which means they need to have good advice, they need to have somebody that they can lean on to get them the trusted partner definition to help them make their way through this. This is where Cisco comes into play. We give them that. We work with internal partners. We work with you external partners to give that advice, to give that direction to the customers so they can make the right decisions to save on their IT costs, yet not compromise on the quality or the programmability and the flexibility of that solution. Um, phase five, just that as a high level nutshell, there's two things. Um, before, um, the HANA database was sized based on the amount of data that you had. It was, if, you had a, if you had a three terabyte database, then you were going to be running somewhere between a four and maybe an eight socket server, simply because of the growth requirements that you may run into. Yet, oddly enough, you may find that uh, your CPU utilization is only around 15%. You spent a lot of money, but you're nowhere near taxing the system. Now what you're gonna do is you're gonna be able to work with the customer and with the SIs and do what's called a um, workload-based sizing. This is going back to the old days of doing quick sizers, where you were working with a partner you were working with the customer, you were working with an SI, and they would say, I'm gonna have this many 
I'm going to have this many users, this many power users. They're going to be doing it, you know, eight hours a day, peak time at this point. These are the workloads, and it would spit out some numbers at the end. We're coming back to that. You don't need to know how to do that. We're, the SI and the customer will run that scenario planning for you, and then we will work with you to make the recommendation on what hardware should be put in place based on those results. So you've got a team surrounding you to be successful in this space. The other thing that was changing was um, the selection of processors. So in the Broadwell space uh, and in Skylake, you can now have a wide variety of custom of processors to use in that design, all the way from a eight socket Silver processor all the way up to the top bin 8180M Skylake processor based on the workloads that you've defined. I'm going to skip through all this stuff. You'll be able to read it on your own. I just wanted to make some quick recommendations to kind of help set the stage for you a little bit in this space. It seems kind of confusing. It can be kind of scary. The customer performances are coming to play. Here's the deal. First of all, we love TDI. We started there. This is the area that we want to be, and we want to make sure you're successful there, whether you're a Cisco account manager or you're a PSS or you're one of our partners. If the customer is looking at a production system, a recommendation for the production system is that you stay with the top end CPUs. That's where you start. If there's any de performance dependencies, if the customer is making statements about we want to make sure that we never have that weight symbol spinning on our screen, stay with the top bin CPUs. You know it's going to work. It's been sized. Uh, it's been tested. It's solid. But if they're coming back and saying, I want to have a production system, but I don't need all, I'm not really concerned about the performance of it as much as others would be, then let's take advantage of that sizing tool and get them the right size processors. Non-production systems, absolutely, save a lot of money. Go to those lower-end processors that meet those responsibilities. A caution to you, don't do the sizing. That's for the customer. That's for the system integrator. If you're a system integrator, then you can go ahead and do those sizings because that's in your space. But by and large, we, we stay away from those sizing because that's not an area that we have the expertise or the area that we're going to play. And in fact, you can expose both yourself and Cisco to a lot of risk by doing that. Um, and then um, the last statement is we get a lot of talk in this TDI stuff about I want TDI and I want it to be certified. Phase 5 TDI is not certified. You don't have to run the tests and meet a certain level before you'll get support from SAP. That's not how this works anymore. What you'll do is you'll set up your system, you'll run your tests, and you'll get a baseline. And you'll say, I'm OK with that baseline. At that point, you move on. If your performance falls below that baseline, well, Mr. Customer, we probably should have had more accuracy in that sizing, or we can work on some issues to help perform that. But, but by and large, these are not validated. They're not certified for performance. All right, so we scrammed through TDI. We're now going to have a quick talk about um, landscapes. So um, typically, SAP is um, a fairly complex configuration. Uh, infrastructure tends to be you know, in multiple data centers for high availability, disaster recovery. We want to make sure that the customer's data is protected. In every data center, you'll have your production system, you'll have your non-production systems where you're going to be doing development work, maybe you're going to be doing qualification work, maybe you want to do some test work. You're going to have a lot of non-production, and you're going to have a production system. And typically, every SAP workload will have its own production and non-production system. So like an ERP will have its own, or maybe a car system will have its own, or maybe a supply chain management system will have its own. So you'll have many implementations. You can see why this is a seven to eight billion dollar business. There's a lot of hardware going out here. But between those data centers, you want to have high availability and data protection, backup recovery, this whole disaster tolerance, and you want to be able to manage that landscape. Typically, the way customers will do this is they'll have two data centers. They'll have one local data center. Within that data center, they'll have a high availability with a local standby. And they'll sync between those two. They'll be very tightly tied, and they'll asynchronously 
replicate the data over to a second data center where they have a remote system or a standby system. With new HANA 2.0, there is an active, active sort of capability. That secondary system can be used as a query system to pull data and pull reports out. You cannot make transactional changes on that second system, but you can get data out of it. So in the high availability disaster recovery space, kind of going on one side, high availability. On the other side is the disaster recovery. I'm not going to go through the details. I want you to walk away with two points. First of all, the SAP HANA software has been designed to facilitate both high availability and disaster recovery. And where there are the gaps between what HANA can do, Cisco has the solutions in place defined by those CVDs available to you in that CVD or as a service that Cisco can bring to the play. You just need to be aware that in any implementation, this needs to happen and Cisco can make it happen. All right, we're coming down to the end. Before I hand it over to George, we got a couple more topics. This is where we're gonna start talking about that programmability. We've pretty much been talking about standard stuff up to this point. The idea of having the ability to program, now we're gonna talk about doing it. We've been working with a partner called Venomic and with SAP and within ourselves, the UCS systems, the ACI systems, to create a solution that's both programmable and automated, bringing that orchestration and automation together. The idea of having your application need, those line of businesses, be able to define the requirements that can be pushed down into the infrastructure that resides in the data center, and to be able to quickly manage that, change it, adapt it, dynamic, flexible, highly secure, and still open to a multi-vendor. This idea of being able to have the idea of application tiers, to be able to define those dependencies between the tiers, to meet the security and the compliance. Compliance and governance is a huge aspect of a lot of SAP customers. How do you actually know your system is doing what you think it's doing? With this system, because of the programmability and automation, you can be assured that it's doing because it will tell you exactly what it is doing. We do this in principle by taking the application or the line of businesses. We look at the line of business requirements and we look at SAP and we map out what does SAP need to do, the software, the application, to be able to meet the needs of that business. And we generate application requirements. Similarly, we take the infrastructure. We take the security aspects of the infrastructure. We take the compute, the networking, the storage. We layer on that best practices that we've identified in those CVDs, everything from the operating system configurations, the networking configurations, everything that's needed to be aware of the application that's running on top of it, and we create these infrastructure capabilities. We marry them together, and we create this idea of a policy. I haven't used this term yet, but the idea of a stateless data center. This compute and network has no personality until you give it that. And so we're able to take the policies that say, how is the system going to perform? How is it going to be measured? How am I going to be able to meter it? And I create all of these policies at the beginning of my, of my adventure here on the, the next generation data center. I create these policies. And once I have those policies created and resident and available, I can just go ahead and create an automation and orchestration software that just pushes it down and programs everything down to the bottom networking, compute, and storage level to be able to give you a very fast stand-up. We do that today with Venomic. Venomic has a single point push button, literally. We had Dimension Data in our data center doing live, de in, excuse me, in our booth at TechEd, doing live demonstrations of how they could deploy, admittedly a simple SAP landscape with a single push of a button in just a few minutes because it was simple, but it was all the way back at their data center, live demo happening right there. From an infrastructure perspective, it looks fairly similar to what you've seen before. We, we are taking advantage of the ACI leaf spine. 
model. You don't need to have all of that in play right now, but the idea being is that the programmability is being taken advantage of. And this is where you get to see the economic value. I'm able to create these policies, not only for my SAP HANA, but for my application tiers, for my different HANA workloads, my different SAP workloads, and even my non-SAP workloads. I can do HANA Vora, and now with this new data hub, I can throw all of those things into the policy mesh and be able to decide how my resources are going to be deployed to best meet my business and data center needs securely in a very compliant and governed manner. It is a huge advantage to those customers who are looking at how do I get from my current data center to that next generation data center. The roadmap. So Cisco is doing a lot in this space. Um, this is a really high level. Um, but what you can see here is we're continuing our infrastructure play. Uh, we're doing an SAP on FlexPod with ACI. This is going to be our base infrastructure that we're going to use for our private cloud and our hybrid cloud. Base infrastructure, orchestration, automation software layers on top of that and is supported. We're going to do the similar thing with FlashStack on Pure. We have down below, we have um, our data protection play with Commvault. That's already been put together. It's been pushed out. It's now in the market. And we're getting started on our MAPR software-defined storage refresh. In the automation space, there are a lot of different areas that we're looking at. Um, OpenStack, um, we have partnered uh, with uh, an OpenStack partner that we're able to show and demonstrate how we can go ahead and deploy an OpenStack cloud on top of a converged infrastructure. In this case, it's a FlexPod. Now, this is for a customer that perhaps would like to have the idea of doing a lot in their own data center. On the other end of the spectrum, we have the Venomic. Venomic is a closed source software. It's very owned in application, and this can be owned in a data center where the customer just sits back and, and lets the software do the work. We're working on a data hub, and then there's this tetration. And the promise of tetration is taking the data center really to that next level. And this is forward-looking work. And the idea behind tetration is it gives us two very major advantages. One, it sees what's going on at the, at the, in the infrastructure. It sees the data moving. It sees where it's coming, where it's going. And at the same time that it's doing that, we can see how we can take advantage of that and remediate issues in our infrastructure through machine learning. The idea of being able to see where my bottlenecks are or where they're going to be and to automatically adjust my network or my compute or my storage to address the bottlenecks as they're happening so I don't have downtime or I don't have to build something when it's coming through. It also tells me where my data is going and where it should and where it shouldn't be going. It's a huge tool That's a, that just brings a whole new level of visibility into the customer space. So we're starting to play in this space with SAP for Tetration. That brings me to the end of my section. I appreciate the time that I've had to chat with you. I kind of flew through a whole bunch of stuff. I just really wanted to share with you this idea that this is a very exciting space. And Cisco is uniquely qualified. We have a great story that we can share with our customers. Are we going to sell the full data center infrastructure every single time? Of course not. But that's the vision that we sell to the customer. And then they, we start them down that path. So with that, George, I'm going to hand it over to you um, if you want to bring Hello. us home. No worries. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Uh, thanks very much for uh, taking us through that um, uh, that session. So, uh, guys, uh, what I'll do is I'll basically just cover a call to action and some additional uh, links and pointers around um, more information where you can learn a little bit more and resources in our region. So, look, as far as the, the key call to action, there's two key things I want to I want uh, to communicate. 
um, and that is firstly uh, education. Okay, I mean basically the more you're armed with understanding, um, you know, the, the SAP marketplace, some key questions you can ask your customer. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the qualification questions and and requirements uh, gathering questions in a subsequent chart. Uh, but the more you understand uh, around, you know, SAP and and what questions to ask, um, you know, the, the better you're going to be equipped in actually progressing these uh, some of these opportunities. And, and secondly, uh, you know, you need to have these application discussions with your customer. Uh, you know, if we're in there talking to customers around, you know, you know it could be around network or it could be around um, sort of generic compute uh, discussions, you know, ask some of those basic questions to your customer around, you know, do they have an SAP landscape? Uh, are they looking at you know, any major upgrades? Are there any uh, compelling events, uh, for example, HANA, et cetera? We need have those um, you know uh, application discussions with a customer, uh, and as I said, um, have some basic education around uh, the SAP ecosystem. Next chart, Eric. So what I typically do, and I've put this chart together to provide the field in, in our region, some of the key qualification questions that I would ask and I encourage you to ask um, in terms of understanding whether it's a real opportunity for us or, or not. And some of these questions, as you can see, you don't actually have to be an S expert in SAP. Uh, a lot of these questions equally apply for any enterprise application or, or, or generic opportunity. So you know, getting, having some understanding of whether the, you know, the customer Customer uh, understands the value of our data center strategy because what I find is when I get a few ticks in the box with some of these questions, these will sort of inform me of whether this is an opportunity that's worth pursuing and we've got a high probability of success. So if a customer does understand our data center strategy, um, you know, if we have active involvement from our AMs or PSSs or the data center partner, um, you know, if, if a customer is looking for an end-to-end -end solution rather than a point solution based on price, these are all pointers to me um, of, a, of a, an opportunity that we have a high probability of success. You know, further to that, um, clearly I want to understand, you know, if this is an existing SAP customer with an existing workload and whether we're looking at a technology refresh opportunity. Uh, if it is, what that existing landscape looks like as far as, you know, development, you know, test, um, production you know, infrastructure. If it is a new project, uh, you know, asking the question around whether it's a, a HANA-driven project, uh, project and what is the scope of that project. So, the, you know, some of the questions I typically ask is having a, you know, basically understand the, you know, what the, get a description of what the SAP landscape looks like in terms of SAP components like, you know, ERP, business warehouse, supply chain management, etc. Uh, across development test production, uh, some information around sizing, whether that could be you know SAPs or you know HANA memory or, or a combination depending on the requirements. Uh, clearly, the use case is important from a sizing and solution perspective because the use case will inform us on which model server we um, would typically um, you know lead with. Um, Eric mentioned appliance versus TDI. A customer may, may want us to provide a recommendation there, or may already have a a view on, on, on which direction they want to take. So we clearly want to understand whether it's an appliance or TDI based solution. And then of course the subsequent questions around high availability, disaster recovery, backup recovery, uh, the level of automation they're looking at the solution, etc. So these are the sort of kind of questions I typically um, you know trying to find out is the is the initial qualification questions, as well as things like you know getting a view on you know who the competition is, um, whether the customer has any specific preference around a cloud-based solution, whether it be private or public, um, and also decision criteria. I mean, we see many times customers moving to a public cloud, and then we actually see them coming back the other way to on-prem because of TCO. Uh, SAP systems are usually active and on all the time. So customers that are looking at deploying large SAP landscape in a public cloud don't usually do it for TCO reasons. They usually do it for agility reasons. So it's worth understanding that. And finally, um, some of the other uh, sort of questions I try to tease out of the conversation with the customer or, or partner is is I, I, I'd like to understand a little bit more around the, the you know, background of, of this particular customer opportunity. So uh, understanding who the SAP system integrator is and, and also uh, if we actually know who that integrator is, for example, an Accenture or Deloitte, uh, I always find it very useful to actually reach out to them and find out more around the project and some of the drivers of that project um, you know, that you may not be able to get from the customer. Uh, so, 
you know, another aspect maybe, for example, you know, uh, reaching out to the SAP account manager, even though my experience has been, generally speaking, that, you know, you've got, you probably don't have that much access to those guys because in many cases they may be selling a competing cloud product like Heck, but, you know, there are some cases, for example, where it is an on-prem solution, so there may be some value in reaching out to the SAP account manager. Uh, other questions, things like, you know, project implementation schedule, you know, when's the customer looking at deploying, you know, development, you know, sandbox environment and go live, um, having a view of whether there's an RFP process or not, and, you know, I mentioned before for whether there's a you know compelling event to, to move to HANA uh, due to, for example, the you know the 2025 deadline that Eric uh, mentioned before. So these, in summary, these are the kind of questions that we as the field need to be asking um, our, our customers and prospects as we kind of navigate through these opportunities because it will inform us, you know, a little bit more and give us a more accurate view uh, on where the sort of, um, you know, high, uh, you know, where the, the high probability of success will be in these SAP opportunities and where the low probability of success will be. So um, that's what I wanted to cover on this chart. Eric, next chart, please. Um, further to that, once we qualify, then typically there's a next sort of um, drill down view on, you know, more detailed sizing questions that we would typically ask the customer to tease out further the requirements regarding, you know, more detailed sizing, um, could be around virtualization, could be around specific services or data tiering requirements, uh, you know, growth, HADR, uh, storage implementation, etc. So we actually do have a predefined sizing questionnaire which provides those additional detailed questions. So I just wanted to just alert you of the fact that we do have this and we can share this with you if required. Next chart, Eric. So just in terms of summarising, um, you know, where you can find more information, uh, we have the, 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 the Go SAP site, which provides a whole bunch of public information which is available to our customers and partners. There's the Sales Connect um, uh, link there you see in, in the second bullet point that provides um, additional information to, to both uh, Cisco and our partners. Uh, on top of that, we have a global virtual engineer, engineering team, TSN, uh, which can be used for, for Q&A, but can also be used to, um, you know, solutioning and, and building bombs. Uh, for the internal folks on the call, we, we do have a Jive site uh, as per that link. And, and also, which I'll cover in a subsequent chart, for our partners and also our Cisco field, we actually do have a, a worldwide Cisco SAP Competence Center Group. Um, Rajiv on the call is part of that team and we have access and we are fortunate to have access to, to some of these folks in, in helping, us, helping us with some of our pre-sales efforts. Next chart, Eric. Just very quickly, and these are more for reference than anything else, um, and we'll leave you with these charts, but you'll see that there's a whole stack of uh, links that we have here that kind of summarise the Cisco validated designs. Uh, Eric mentioned before uh, we, we, the, the development of a number of our CBDs, which is, again, unique in our marketplace where we have these uh, predefined implementation guides and reference architectures around SAP. You'll see a list there across a number of our uh, converged infrastructures and software-defined uh, storage um, uh, solutions. And further to that, Eric, next chart, you'll see some additional links around some additional, uh, some white papers um, relating to SAP around, you know, virtualized systems, again, you know, converged infrastructures and, and, and other material there that you'll, uh, you can, you know, you'll find of value. So we'll leave you with all these uh, links as part of the, uh, the deck. And finally, um, as far as resources in a region, I mentioned TSN, uh, Technology Solution Network. So please, you know, if in doubt, um, use that global virtual engineering link, ask hyphen SAP hyphen TSN at Cisco.com. If you need any specific help around any pre-sales work for uh, building bombs or, or sizing, uh, I mentioned the Worldwide SAP Competence Centre. Rajiv is on the call. He's one of the, the Worldwide SAP gurus, uh, Saroj and Keith are, are others, and there's an email address there. And finally, myself, from an APJ sales perspective, um, George Manusis, you'll see my email details there as well. So, you know, feel free to reach out uh, to any of those um, you know, resources as you see fit uh, within the opportunities. 
And finally, what I wanted to mention, um, uh, if you can just, I'm not sure if there's any other chart, Eric, or we close that out here, but just wanted to finally mention, please don't be, don't be overawed with, um, you know, working on an SAP opportunity. Sometimes it's just the basic questions that we can ask a customer, some basic application questions, which will trigger an opportunity. So, you know, feel free to reach out to, 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 to the resources that we've listed. We're here to help, um, you know, get educated, learn some of the lingo, because even some of the basic lingo around just asking some you know basic questions about for example you know describe your SAP landscape and you know what what are your you know growth plans and are you looking at any major um, you know upgrades um, coming up in, in your uh, in, in your cycle I and mean, just just key questions like that can easily trigger an SAP opportunity so in summary get educated uh, you know uh, reach out to the the required SAP resources and um, and good selling thank you what we'll do now, uh, and Rajesh, I'll, I'll hand it back to you, but I think we're going to have a, a, a Q&A session uh, for the rest of the, the webinar uh, period for um, just uh, have it open to, to the rest of the, the folks who may wish to ask some specific questions. Thank you. Yeah, George. Uh, let's open the session for live Q&A now. Uh, you can post your questions in the Q&A panel, or you can also use the raise hand option, and I can admit you to speak out with your question. We do have one question in the chat window, George. Let me read that to you. Uh, where can we find more info on HEC? So George, where, where can we find more info on what? Sorry, I missed that. HEC. I think Rajiv has responded, I believe. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, uh, as in HANA Enterprise Cloud. So there's been a couple of links that were put into the chat room where you can find general information. Um, specifically, I mentioned CenturyLink before. CenturyLink is one of the vendors that's providing the HANA Enterprise Cloud for SAP. And uh, we would love to get you more information on that. Uh, George, you can reach out to George, or you can reach out to a gentleman named Doug Wilson, or actually anybody on this call, Rajiv, or Saroj, or uh, Keith. Thanks, Eric. Mm -hmm. Any further questions? We don't have any other questions. Let's uh, give them a minute. Yep. I think we've got five minutes left anyway, so yeah. guys, feel free to uh, post any questions or um, ask the question online. Okay, there is a question from Rimeka Anand. Uh, does Cisco Hyperflex support SAP HANA? Eric, did you want to take that one? I'm, I didn't quite catch the question. Uh, does Cisco Hyperflex support SAP HANA? Um, so well, I'm going to say uh, sort of. Uh, we do have two white papers that are available if you go to the cisco.com slash go slash SAP, you'll see the two white papers uh, where we can do an SAP deployment on Hyperflex, hyperconverged Hyperflex. Um, for non-production, you can put the HANA database on the uh, hyperconverged, the Hyperflex system. For production, SAP does not support HANA in the hyperconverged infrastructure yet. So what you do uh, is you you would buy you would put a single server outside of the hyperconverged, or you would run your HANA database. It would be under the same Fabric interconnect, and you would run your uh, application presentations and other servers in the hyperconverged solution in that hyperflex. Again, those white papers are on cisco.com slash go slash SAP. Eric, I, I understand, I'll just, just to add to that uh, conversation, I understand that we were the, the, the first uh, hyperconverged vendor that actually um, uh, were on the uh, SAP HANA entry level supported um, list uh, from as far as the hyperconverged solution is concerned. Um, not sure if others like Nutanix or others have actually been added since, but 
uh, I do note that we we were added or were the first added from a from a hyperconverged solutions perspective. Um, I'm not sure. We would have to go check to see if there's any others there. I don't recall yeah. seeing any. Yeah, I don't. I don't believe so either. Yeah. Okay, Eric. We have another question from Dasni. Uh, how IOPS of an application server is affecting total hardware sizing? Whew. So <laughs> we just we do have a full up sizing. I don't know if we could handle that in this quick call. Um, Rajiv, I don't know if you're on the line or George. Do you know the answer to that one? Uh, sorry, I'm just looking at the question now. How IOPS of an application is affected? How IOPS of an application server? Yeah, um, usually the IOPS is usually tied to the database server. It's not something in my experience that has ever been uh, a dependency for the application server, the SAP application server that is. Yeah, George, maybe I can also elaborate a bit more in that sure. any, any SAP environment, uh, typically the database server is the I.O. subsystem that provides the maximum amount of data throughput. So therefore, the database server is where your IOPS are really be measured. Um, application servers are really compute engines. Um, they actually transact, they execute code uh, against both uh, the processor and memory. But in terms of IOPS, um, there isn't a lot of disk activity, for example, or, or actual read-write access to, uh, let's say, persistent me memory on an application server. So um, I think that's probably the best answer is that, you know, I think you need to look at the IOPS directly on the database server and understand where um, the effect could be from there. Typically, just to add to that, thanks, Rajiv, um, the, the disk configuration for an application server is minimal and it's uh, usually not driven by ops. So um, uh, as you correctly said, it's a, it's a database server dependency, but not necessarily uh, something that we need to cater for for application server, given that application servers are usually not I.O. bound, rather CPU bound than memory, potentially. And perhaps there's one other uh, point we can also bring up since we're talking about application servers and that there was a question earlier about Hyperflex. And um, you know, for, for the actual core database uh, systems, Hyperflex is uh, not supported for production workloads. But for any application instance in the SAP uh, space, you can absolutely use Hyperflex because um, you tend to see a lot of virtualized instances for application instances. And Cisco Hyperflex is a uh, perfect platform to deploy Agreed. virtualized instances. Okay, uh, we're coming up to the uh, to the hour, yep. uh, or to the half hour. Is there, are there any other questions before we wrap up the call? Yeah, Sharon is asking us to show the partner resource links. Uh, I hope it's already in the deck and it will be shared to you, Sharon. Yeah, so do you have anything to add or we can wrap up the session? Yeah. We'll share the deck, which includes the resource links. Uh, um, so uh, that should be able to that should be able to answer that question uh, once we share the link, share the, the deck. Thank you, George, and thanks again, everyone, for attending today's session. Uh, just a quick reminder: once you end the session, a short survey will automatically pop up on your screen. We appreciate if you could spare a minute and fill out the short survey to let us know your experience. Thanks again, and have a good day ahead. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Rajiv. Thank you. Great talking with you.